imagine that I could recondense this with AMP in one step and basically only use one ATP for one. At that point, I have got to use two. So, is there a total of four ATPs being consumed in your cycle? So you would say there's a total of four consumed. You would say that there's an NADH being generated. Um, but you could also say that um, Glutamate here, if you're, if you're collecting amino acids in the diet in the form of glutamate, um, and we're excreting the nitrogen, and, and, and it's coming in from other tissues, and glutamine is coming in from other tissues, we've got all this carbon skeleton, right? Mm -hmm. And we're in the mitochondria here. Once we split off ammonium here, um, we've generated alpha ketoglutarate, right? Um, and we've also generated alpha ketoglutarate if we we use this reaction here to generate aspartate. So the extra, the extra met metabolite carbon is showing up in the mitochondria as alpha ketoglutarate. And once it's in there, it's going to go through the TCA cycle. So you're going to get more energy out of that as well. So it seems to me, at least, <laughs> that when you, when you build up this extra alpha, alpha ketoglutarate um, by, by um, taking the ammonia off the glutamate, that this can also provide metabolic energy because it's going to go through the TCA cycle. And it makes sense because you, you are bringing in these nitrogen-related metabolites from elsewhere in the body. And once you've taken that nitrogen off, um, there has to be a net use of that. Right? And you're in the mitochondria where things get oxidized. So it would make sense to me, at least, that this, this should be used for energy production. Then you, if, if in that case you would say that because you're bringing in metabolites from elsewhere in the body and you're in the mitochondria and it's sort of like what's left over after you've taken out the nitrogen is a metabolite that's basically a TCA cycle metabolite. Right? I mean, it's about part way through, so you're not going to get the whole TCA energy, but you're going to get a couple of NADHs out of it. So, you know, in that sense, yes, it, I, guess, I guess if you look at it from the point of view of the whole body and um, you brought that glutamate in, um, if you hadn't, then you, made a, you could have made alpha KG out of it somewhere else, and then you would have used up the energy. You would have gotten the energy somewhere else. So you, in a sense, you haven't gotten the energy in whatever tissue that glutamine came from. So in that sense, no, then you don't get it. So you, this stuff is, it gets a little bit intricate, as you can tell, because um, there's so many interconnections, and you can look at it in so many different ways. That it's, it's really hard for me to give you a definitive statement of, about everything. Yeah. I get what you're saying about how like, the energy costs to regenerate the ATP, but I don't understand still how we're getting that it uses four ATP because I can I feel like I only. Like yeah, well, there are two here. There's yeah. two here. And then why are there two? There? And then there's two here because you go PPI immediately goes to two phosphates. Yeah. So then you need if and then you have AMP. So AMP plus phosphate plus. Um, if you, if you phosphorylate AMP, then you need to transfer that from a high energy compound to form that new phosphodiester bond, right? I mean, AMP plus PI to ADP doesn't just happen, that's highly unfavorable. Right? So you need to use an ATP to do that, right? If I'm, here at, if I'm here with AMP and I want to make ADP out of it and I want to add phosphate, that's going to cost me. And similarly, to get the ATP back, it's going to cost me again. Off state. Yeah, but if you look at the energy cost of the cell, okay. then that's part of what's going on. Okay. Yeah, and if you just if I just, if you just say, well, how many ATPs get used, you know, right on the protein molecules that are doing these transformations, then yeah, three. Okay. But the ATP equivalent, the equivalent in ATP energy is four. Okay. Right. And usually when we're doing like energy additions, like mm -hmm. the TCA, TCA cycling, we're going to do for fats. Um, we're we're talking about ATP equivalents. Yeah. So, I thought the urea cycle was just like 
the next couple slides down, not this whole top part that's happening in the mitochondria. That's where. Yeah, this is, this, the, this, this is just the urea cycle, which is this. Yeah. So that's why I'm confused why you're saying that there's four ATP used. Yeah. Okay. Um, sure. Um, I just want to be clear in terms of like not getting mixed up on an exam or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're that's right. all. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. I shouldn't have said that. So, so um, it takes two to make the necessary precursor to go into the, the urea cycle. Okay. So if I talk about it that way, then I'm right. Um, okay. This precursor. Oh, no, I'm, yeah. Yeah, so, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm not trying to like split no, hairs, Mike. Nice. I'm making sure yeah. I understand. Okay. Other questions? We need to, we need to get out of this urea cycle. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this is a lot more detail than I would ask you about. Sam. I mean, all this. this I'm sorry. How much NADPH is produced during the cycle? Did you say one or two? There's one. know what lipids look like. They're highly energy rich because they're long hydrocarbon chains. Um, and so they're very well suited to serve as storage fuel. So we already know that glycogen can be a storage fuel. But that's just short storing of polymerized sugar, which is, which is oxidized compared to fat. So storing fats stores up a lot more metabolic energy than storing sugars, as we'll see when we do the ATP arithmetic shortly. So the problem though is that fats are very hydrophobic and they're going to aggregate into little oil droplets and then, then what are you going to do? Right? You, have this, you have this great storage form but it's like an oil droplet in this cell somewhere and you have to worry about like actually extracting it so that the, the fat molecules can get put on enzymes and get you know, oxidized in steps and make ATP eventually. Sorry? Put a handle on it. Put a handle on it. Well, at least find a way to get yeah, get away, find a way to grab it. Absolutely. Yeah. So dietary liquids are processed. They come in in the diet, right? Um, they get emulsified first into these mixed micelles. Right? So that basically, because fats are insoluble, emulsifying just basically means making up, basically breaking up the droplets into very very small micro droplets. So you can't go all the way but it can at least provide a lot more surface area to access the, the fat. Right? And then um, that's done sufficiently so that lipases in the intestine can degrade the triacylglycerol, which is the same. Triacylglycerol is a fat. Right? So um, lipases are enzymes that hydrolyze off, using water, hydrolyze off the fatty acid. Right? So you would end up with, with C double bond OH here and so we have a glycerol backbone and potential action by different phospholipases, don't worry about the details, um, to generate the glycerol backbone and the side chain, the, the R groups. So that happens first pretty much right away in the diet as soon as the incoming fat of the diet gets emulsified. Um, the glycerol that comes off um, uh, is, a, is eventually metabolized, you know, it gets transported through the bloodstream and gets into cells, and is eventually metabolized to yield energy. It's only about 5% of the total, but the cell, the body still doesn't waste it, right? So there's a couple of steps. These are different, these are enzymes that are different from the ones that we've seen so far. So glycerol kinase phosphorylates glycerol, and then a dehydrogenase um, oxidizes it to dihydroxyacetone phosphate. So notice we've already made an NADH. So that's good for oxidative phosphorylation. And then once we're at DHAP, of course, we're in glycolysis. And so it's only two steps to glycolysis. And so this is how the, the energy that's left over in this carbon skeleton is harvested. So we've broken down um, the fatty acids into uh, glycerol and the fats into glycerol plus the fatty acids. Um, and then these are taken up in the, in the, the uh, epithelium of the intestine of the mucosa and reconverted back into fats. And then um, once they're reconverted back into fats, they're incorporated into particles that shoot through the bloodstream. 
And those particles have names like chylomicrons, that's actually the most um, common one. Um, but they also have names like HDL, LDL, VLDL, like all the, the uh, particles um, that are essential to transporting women through the bloodstream. And if they build up too much in the bloodstream, then they can cause uh, plaques on the blood, arteries, and things like that. Um, so it's in this form that they then go through the blood, right, and eventually enter the cells. And then when they get in the cells, the triacylglycerols are then broken down yet again. So they're broken down, they're taken up into the, into, um, into the bloodstream, they're re-esterified into these particles, they're taken through the blood, and then they're broken down again into the cells. Okay. So this is an example of what, that, what these particles look like. Uh, there's some material in the text that, that we don't usually cover, uh, that we're not covering. But the napolipoprotein would basically be proteins that are associated with these lipids um, to sort of help it make a stable particle and to emulsify them to a certain extent. And then you have cholesterol in there. This is the worst depiction of cholesterol I've ever seen. Um, and, uh, and all the you know, other kinds of, of uh, fats and phospholipids and such. Right? And depending on the ratio of protein to lipid, um, you, either, you, know, you will have um, these different kinds of Depending, if there's more protein, it's denser. If there's less protein, it's lighter. There's lipid is lighter than protein, um, and so these particles have different pro different physiological properties as they circulate. Um, so, um, so fatty acids enter the cell again, um, and then they're oxidized as fuel, or they're reesterified for storage. So this is a lipase here. Right, that breaks down the fatty acid that's been, that's been transferred here. As they enter the cells, um, these particles are broken down in part by the actions of lipases so that free fatty acids can enter the cells. And then it can be oxidized. If it's, if it's a fat cell, um, 